Mythos Busters, investigating the mystery, monsters, and madness of Arkham Horror, the card game. Hello and welcome to episode 140 of the Mythos Busters. I'm Scott and there is no one else here with me, but that is because we recently came back from Arkham Knights at the Game Center in Roseville, Minnesota, where we had an awesome weekend the game center it was fantastic ran an awesome event but we were also allowed to run a panel with the current designers of the arkham horror card game that we all know and love and on the panel from left to right we had duke mj nick and jeremy Uh, we also had ian on there because he was answering some questions about fortune and folly and sean and i are the ones kind of running the show I did my best to try and edit out all the weird pauses because we were all handing around two microphones on stage uh, and also the background noise. Now, please remember, this was recorded live. We are right next to the main hall of the event, uh, so there is going to be background noise. Really sorry about that, but I did the best I could. Hope you all enjoy this. We'll talk to you next time. And welcome to the developer panel. I'm Sean. I'm Scott. And I'm Ian. I'm Duke. I am Maxine, or MJ. I'm the lead developer for Arkham Horror the Card Game. I'm Nick. And I'm Jeremy. Ever the difficult one, Nick. Ever the difficult one. So, uh, Scott, Ian, and I uh, comprise three-fourths of the Mythos Busters. We do a podcast about the Arkham LCG, uh, and, and as well as other community organizing. Though, Ian, if I'm not mistaken, I think your orientation is a little jacked up for this panel. Get, get, get gone. <laughs> FFG exacts a heavy toll. Nick was once one of ours, too. Lost him very recently. But anyway... You we can't been... have him back. Oh, well. <laughs> we, we've resigned it. Uh, but we've been given this wonderful opportunity to sit down with the uh, developers of this game. I, I personally think that one of the great parts of being uh, in the community for this game is that the developers are not only very engaged with the community, but they're very accessible. Um, they show up for lots of things and, and they're always happy to talk about what they, what they do, so uh, we thought we'd take the opportunity. So the way this is going to roll is uh, we've got a couple questions and uh, topics we're going to roll through with these guys, and then at a certain point we are going to open the, uh, the floor to, to any questions you guys might have. The caveat being, of course, as always, that uh, no confirmations of future product may be made. So steer clear of that topic and we should be smooth sailing. Well, let's start out though, tonight. Uh, we just played Fortune and Folly. That was really fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty great. Beat Nick Snap. So I guess my first question is, uh, how did Fortune and Folly come about? Uh, yeah, so we were working on the Scarlet Keys, and we were looking for a standalone to include as sort of a, um, sort of like a, uh, like an, almost like an appendix sort of scenario, um, that's like part of the Scarlet Keys campaign, but like optional, and so I went around to a few people, and I, uh, I took some pitches, um, and Ian's pitch was basically perfect, like it was exactly what we wanted, um, it was set uh, somewhere we've never done a scenario before uh, in Monaco. Um, it was a heist, which is cool, fit the Scarlet Keys theme really well, um, and even like the villain made like for a perfect coterie inclusion. So, um, so it was really kind of the best choice, almost like the only choice. Um, and so yeah, that's. And then, do you want to speak more about your part? Yeah, my part of it was first getting the opportunity to design a scenario for my favorite game was like, okay, I'm (laughs) through the roof. Uh, But when I had the opportunity to do a pitch, I think I wrote down five ideas originally, and then cut it down to three and wrote out like a page of each, kind of trying to flesh it out. Uh, But I think at the end of the day, in the back of my mind, I always knew it was going to be the heist idea. I think since even the early days of the game, I was like, there needs to be a heist scenario at some point. So that was really the genesis. Started with one word, heist, and went from there. Awesome. Was this scenario based on a specific heist? Personal experience, perhaps? Or <laughs> did you just watch Ocean's Eleven? Uh, not personal experience, no. Sadly, happily. I'm not sure which one. Um, <laughs> Definitely sadly. 
Yeah, definitely, obviously, I mean, heist is just such a big thing in a lot of movies. Ocean's Eleven, obviously, is an influence. But I was also very influenced by certain video games, like my experience playing old school stealth games like Metal Gear Solid back in the day, and uh, Tenchu, games like that, which aren't necessarily like a heist, but it has that element of like trying to sneak past guards and all of a sudden they can't see you because you're invisible because you move like five feet away, but <laughs> all those type of good things. But yeah, it wasn't necessarily based on a real life event, obviously, or a certain specific movie, but just that heist idea that's so um, prevalent in lots of media. I, I actually feel like your first draft was very Metal Gear Solid, even. Like it had sort of like that alertness level mechanic. Yeah. Did it have exclamation point tokens? I wish. Oh my god. <laughs> so with, with a heist, like the, the format of a heist is so intricate. There are so many variables and to do it as a game you kind of have to uh, uh, be able to account for the fact that they might miss some things and some things might go wrong in some plays versus others. Like, how do you even start to conceive of that logic map? I mean, obviously, like, lots of things with this scenario developed over time. Um, and the way I approach a lot of things as a designer is just tend to make it very overcomplicated at the beginning and throw as many things as possible at the wall. And then the rest of the development really is cutting it down. And Maxine was great with that because she was through the process like, okay, we need to cut more and more and more um, and streamline it more. Uh, but because she has that experience, obviously. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of Matt. I drew several different versions of the casino floor plan. Um, and then, yeah, figuring out the, the different aspects of how you could advance through the heist. I think the most important thing we wanted is to be a little bit open ended that. You don't necessarily have to do everything, but you're gonna have to do certain elements because your plan, like any heist, your plans might have to change part way through, and all of a sudden you have to, all of a sudden improvise and do something else instead. How did you balance the idea that, I mean, heists are usually done by criminals, in, in general, I would assume, I mean, that's a criminal act. I mean, but, what's a criminal? Uh, yeah. Um, but usually we see the investigators as the good guys, but putting them in a heist, stealing, you know, doing all these nefarious things that might put them in a bad light. What, how did you balance that in the scenario? I think what Scott's asking is, do you officially denounce larceny? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know we have some criminal aspects of the game, right? the criminal players, but I mean, Daisy? <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, I think Maxine and maybe others can speak to this in terms of some of the Scarlet Key integrations, but I think part of that was how it integrates into that particular story. And also just the idea of, yeah, maybe crime is, a heist is technically illegal. <laughs> but in this case, when you're trying to take away a dangerous relic from someone who might use it to do evil, I mean, it's, it's relative, right? Yeah, I feel like storytelling is rife with stories of like picaresque thieves who, um, you know, they're criminals with a heart of gold and they're doing the right thing. And um, as an underdog story, it fits really well because they have all the power and you're the ones kind of trying to swoop in and do something about it. Um, I also have like pretty radical views on property, so maybe, <laughs> I mean, that is, you know, whatever. But yeah. I think also like there's an emerging narrative that the players can provide for themselves. There's a long history of, oh, you just happened to see the wrong thing, and now you're helping us in I stories. So I like that. Yeah, for sure. And I think part of that is you can influence that. I mean, you can just go right for the objective and do minimal crime, or you can just take the advantage to get as many resources as possible. So choose your own adventure. Arkham. Arkham's always been a game where you're kind of helping to tell the story. Uh, like, I'm, we're only giving like half the narrative and you guys are making up the rest. So how your investigator, how your character like deals with the idea of performing a heist is kind of up to you. Maybe it's very reluctant, you know? And also maybe it depends on the character you're playing. If you're playing Finn Edwards, you probably don't care. <laughs> <laughs> To that point, I think one of the uh, one of the most ridiculous parts of at least my first playthrough of it was the poker mechanic. That was 
the gambling was implemented so wonderfully, and that first time I was going for a straight and I'm mulliganed into it, it's just, it's everything gambling is. So where did that start, and how long did that take to dial in? I think that was probably one of the earliest elements of the scenario. I've always been a big fan of games within games, whether you're talking about like mini games in a video game RPG, or even within Arkham and The House Always Wins, which was a very early scenario. It had that element. So I kind of imagine this almost as a, a more um, extensive version of House Always Wins, just in the fact that the, the games are more extensive, the mechanic is more fleshed out, because it's a standalone versus a scenario that's part of a campaign. So that's really how it developed. But there were quite a few iterations of how the games worked. Um, you know, initially there were playing around with maybe it's key to the chaos bag or like cards in your hand instead or uh, cards in your deck. And I think the idea to have the game icons actually came from I think it was Nate. I believe so. Yeah, yeah. We, we had a playtest with Nate French, who's an uh, executive game designer at FFG, and also co-lead designer for Arkham Horror the Card Game. And he's also an avid poker yes. player. <laughs> yeah, like World Series of Poker. Um, so he was like, I really just want to play poker. Is there any way we can do that? And I was like, yeah, I think we can. <laughs> Yeah, and when you passed along that idea, I was like, oh, first off, we can do that? We can put game icons? Okay, yeah. Because it actually solved a lot of like scenario challenges of like, then all of a sudden the games kind of just fell into place from there. What's something, I think Ian and MJ mostly, but anyways, what is something you would like players to know about the scenario? Maybe something that missed in flavor text, or are there any like Easter eggs you'd like to share? I'm gonna answer first. As someone who has only played it, and I just played it the one time, I have no other experience with it beyond that one playthrough, but the flavor text on the practiced side of the muscle yes. is far and away the best part of that scenario. So, yeah, but you can answer for real now. Ian, do you remember the flavor text on that side? Um. There are quite a few, especially in flavor text, references to certain TV shows and all other culture elements that I really like. I kind of, I kind of want people to discover them, uh, but I will say, especially um, if you played through the scenario, the appearance of the dimensional shambler and how it happens is really tied into dimensional shambler lore that I found through researching those uh, creatures, especially the idea that sometimes if certain improbable events keep occurring uh, multiple times in a row, that that's what can sometimes summon them through the dimensions, and that's where that kind of aspect came. Because yeah, as I was watching you guys play, and you got the, the Fortune's Disfavor card that makes just random injuries happen, and we were reading the story text, and I was like, man, that's so funny. It's like slipping on dice, and <laughs> like chandelier is falling on your head. That's great. I mean, I've stepped on dice, and that's enough. I mean, obviously, as you go through such a complicated scenario, there's gotta be ebbs and flows of the, the progression, but is there anything that just kind of fell into place that you're just so excited about the way it turned out? I feel like the, the various tasks on the story card, and then, the story text that like sets those up is really tight. Like it's really good. Uh, like it's a little bit of reading, but it really helps you. It really helps sell the narrative that we're trying to tell. Which in a card game is difficult because card games are very abstracted um, by their very nature. So the fact that we were able to tell like like oh if you sit down at the high rollers table you might be able to get this guy into giving his medallion to you and that helps you later on. Um, and then when you actually play uh, and you see that that's a reward in the high rollers table, it makes sense. You're like, oh, cool. Yeah. I think for me, one of the things was the four roll cards that you can choose from, because the actual effects on the cards went through a lot of iterations, but the idea of having them, like, that was kind of the logical next step. Once there's a heist, well, you have to have heist rolls. You have to have the face, you have to have the muscle. And so figuring out what those were gonna be and how they would work um, took, took some effort and lots of changes and refinement um, from various people, but I'm very happy with how they turned out and how they give you that feeling of being a heist. 
So one of my favorite questions um, when we have MJ or any of the other designers on the podcast is when we're, we're talking about a, a new campaign that hasn't come out yet, and we say, hey, what are the four investigators we should take into that campaign with no reasoning, not like story mechanics, whatever, we just we leave people to figure it out themselves. Um, for your head candidates, what, what are the four investigators doing the heist? For, for Fortune and Folly or for the Scarlet Keys? Fortune Keys? and Folly. Okay. We'll start with Fortune and Folly, and then okay. if you want to answer that for TSK as well. I feel like that's easy. It's just all rogues. It's like, <laughs> like Skid, I won't argue. Skids O'Toole Grifter, right? Preston or Jenny Face, right? Kaimani Thief, and then uh, Tony Muscle. Don. I did it. I win. <laughs> I don't think I can top that. So for finding room for Finn. Four Finns, I think? Yeah. Finn, Finn could also be Thief. <laughs> yeah. Finn or Kaimani. One or the other. So... Going into the Scarlet Keys, without any context, not for story, not for mechanics, from each of you, as far as you know, what would your, your, your team of four investigators, and it could be a way for you to drop hints at people, but we'll only figure it out once we play the campaign. So, yeah. I would say like, Roland, Trish, uh, what Ursula, are sure, Kaimani, just Kaimani. All four players. I mean, Charlie, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. No explanation necessary. <laughs> Just play five player at home. Yeah, break it up to two of them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. <laughs> so, kind of, kind of getting back to what you were talking about with the Shambler, uh, kind of the when the heist was announced. Obviously, anything like that in the Arkham series, you know, something will turn into the extra dimensional, the Lovecraftian. But I'm always curious, like, how do you choose where it goes and, and what intrudes? And, you know, sometimes factions mix and there's, there's lots of decisions as to what you actually include there and why. So how did you arrive at, at what you guys ended up arriving at? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say I think that was a very important element, and you talked with me about that early, Maxine, about, like, it's a heist, but this is still Arkham Horror, and there needs to be that element in it. And it does help to add that twist that's very important, because I think a lot of times when you're playing through that scenario, you get to that point where, we got this, we've done a lot of games, we have a hang of this, and then everything changes. But in terms of dimensional shambler, it's not a very complicated answer. I just really like that particular monster in the mythos. I wanted to include it, and I thought it would be, it could add some cool elements because I, I mentioned that, that aspect where they respond to improbable events, and so it just seemed like a, a perfect fit for a scenario that's all about probability. If I remember correctly, you, you came to me and you were like, yeah, I want to do Dimensional, sh dimensional Shambler, and I don't remember if it was me or you, but it was like pretty quickly there was a consensus that was like, well, we should do like different kinds of dimensional shame. Like, what if we did like dimensional this and that and the other thing? Um, so that's how all the various enemies uh, came to be. So we're gonna jump into more general Arkham questions now. So it's yes, please, Nick and Jeremy are very. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know Nick wants to talk. He's a theater kid, so. Um, how do you, and this is kind of like the royal you, and you can each answer if you'd like, how do you narrow down ideas when you have too many? Whether it's for a campaign, for a scenario, like how do you kind of get the wheat from the chaff? I mean, I'm still new, but you don't. I don't. You just throw them all in, right? That's what we're doing, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Someone else chooses for you. <laughs> I feel like, um, as with anything, you kind of have to sort of sculpt what you want it to be, kind of create a treatment, create an idea of sort of the general idea. Obviously that can change through the process, but if you have something that you're excited about, I think that's actually the core, is if you find something that makes you excited that you can't stop thinking about, that's the place to start. Yeah, usually it's 
usually it's exactly that. Like I'll have a bunch of ideas, but there's one that I just keep coming back to over and over and over again. And uh, if it just sticks in my brain like that, then that, that's usually a signal to me that it's a good idea, um, usually. Yeah, I think uh, timing can be a big factor as well. Uh, sometimes it's better to wait for a good idea or push back earlier, do something else sooner. Like we did the you know, Edge of campaign, you don't want to do an Arctic campaign follow up the next year. Like, want to go somewhere else, do something different. So sometimes Tommy can play a big role as well, help them to decide what to do sooner or later. Yeah, actually, playing off of that answer, like the Dream Eaters was one of the first campaigns I ever thought of. Just the idea, like, you have, you know, half of the investigators are in the dreamlands and half of them are watching over their sleeping bodies and then stuff happened. Um, but, you know, I knew off the bat that it was a very complicated sort of premise. So, uh, so we did Dawnwitch, and then we did Carcosa, and then we did Forgotten Age, and so on and so forth, until finally I was like, it's time. You know what I mean? So along those same lines, as you're ideating and, and sifting through and selecting your ideas, um, I've kind of always held, and I say this specifically about Maxine, but I mean it about everyone who works on the game, but I've always said that uh, weird Maxine is best Maxine. Because when, when you design particularly player cards, but obviously when, when things happen, the encounter, this applies too, and you design things that kind of shock and step outside of the conventions that have been previously established, um, either from a mechanical standpoint or from a theme standpoint, it's, it's very, very fun. If it were me, it would all be like dinosaurs and, and sorceresses. You're hired. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Knew it. Uh, but uh, how do you draw the line or, or find what feels appropriate for the, the IP or the setting or, or what you're working on and not just go full weird? <laughs> Usually it's when everyone tells me it's bad. <laughs> like, if they just give me free reign, it's just weird. It's always weird. And then usually it's like, someone in the story group or someone a playtester is like, I don't understand what's happening at all. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll cut that. <laughs> I mean, I feel like so much of making something is listening to the voices of those that that are there and trusting those voices, getting the, the voices of people that um, who have good taste, who know how to make things well as well, that kind of brings out the best in whatever you're making. I think a big part of it too is you have to consider the source material that you're drawing on, like with Arkham and a cycle, like each cycle pulls from a different series or singular piece of source material, uh, often Lovecraft related. and. What's appropriate for, for instance, like the Path to Carcosa wouldn't be necessarily appropriate for Shadow Over Innsmouth or the Dreamlands. And so keeping in mind what you started with and what this is all coming from is a really good way to keep yourself grounded as well. Yeah, I think feedback and advice from other people is very important. You know, other designers, coworkers, a story group can be a, a very crucial source of information, even upper management sometimes. Like, yeah, they have a strong opinion. You know, they could definitely change on what the product shapes and changes in the future as well. So, yeah, just even play terraces like mentioned before, they provide lots of excellent feedback as well. So, yeah, just listen to other people, take the feedback and advice to heart. We often set like a mood board or a storyboard sort of for different campaigns and sometimes even for different scenarios. And so we want to like hit those themes. So then all the decisions we make within that campaign or within that scenario is meant to sort of drive those points home, you know what I mean? And if you have a scenario that strays too far from that, sometimes it works because it's like a break in the campaign, City of Archives. Uh, but then other times uh, it's like, oh, this feels weird in this campaign, and then you like change it and start over. Repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> iterate, iterate. Uh, so similar question um, as it pertains to difficulty. Uh, which is, I, I imagine, a harder thing to get your thumb under your thumb. Uh, and, and I'm going to point this at Jeremy Zorn first. <laughs> and Jeremy Zorn, multiple world champion of multiple LCGs. I've played with you. You are a machine. How do you check that? Uh, that is a difficult question. Usually I clearly push things a little too far. I get a lot of feedback like, this is too much, this is too hard, this isn't maybe as fun, so... Yeah, a lot of times that's a good reason to listen to playtesters and fellow designers because 
yeah, sometimes I play it a different way. And, and so it's good to listen to other people and make sure, all right, maybe it's too hard, maybe it's too far, let's dial some things down. And so yeah, you can listen to the feedback of those around you and play testers is yeah, very important. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna second that. Play tester feedback has been immensely helpful in dialing in difficulty and stuff. I tend to design too easy. I'm kind of the opposite of Jeremy, at least currently. Um, and so having play testers come back and say things like, yeah, I beat it in two turns. And it's like, whoa, okay, all right. I make that a little harder now. So yeah, playtester feedback is, is a huge factor in determining difficulty, I think. Yeah, it's basically trial and error. There's no science behind it. You just keep trying until it feels right. And like, my rule of thumb is if Jeremy finds it easy, it's probably, it's probably pretty hard. So uh, it's, that's usually a sign that it's good. Um, I'm just kidding, but I'm not kidding. I was just gonna say, yeah, listening. Huh. I didn't have anything else to say. <laughs> so another very individual question, but for all of you. Um, what's your biggest hurdle with creativity, with the design process? Do you get writer's block? Sometimes you have too many ideas. Um, what, what's your biggest hurdle, and how do you find you get over it? That's a tough one. I know. Sorry, I dropped that. Just, just a bomb of a question. I am definitely a too many ideas guy. Uh, I always have been. I've always been flooded with ideas. I know Justin's like, what? Uh, no, it's true. Uh, I always, I'm always, even when I'm 110% passionately devoted to the thing I'm working on, I'm always thinking of what comes after because I always have different ideas coming in my head and I'm always excited to, to try new things. Um, that is my biggest hurdle currently, is, is focusing in on one thing until it's done. <laughs> so that's me. Uh, yeah, also kind of, kind of similar to a lot of ideas. Like one of the toughest things is how to like execute those ideas. It can be very difficult at times to have this really cool idea. Sometimes it's just not feasible. Like it's a printed product, we can't you know like, do digital stuff like that. So there's a lot of restrictions. Sometimes that's a good thing in some ways, but one of the most difficult things is you have this really cool idea. It's like, will this even work? Is this even feasible? And sometimes it's not. So. That can be a, a very difficult challenge trying to find what would work. A cool idea that can actually work and be printed and, and be fun can be challenging. Maxine, do you ever get writer's block? Because it doesn't seem like it. No? Okay. I, I think it's more that I'm just really stubborn. And if I have an idea, it takes a unified front to dissuade me. <laughs> like every single playtester is like, no. And I'm like, all right, fine. Well, at least there's a process. <laughs> Sort of. Oh, is that... Does that check out? Okay. <laughs> For myself, I find like about a third of the way into a project, I will doubt everything and my value and uh, even... I just have these big existential questions and that's the point where I have to press through and be like, no, 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 no. There were reasons why this was interesting or that made me excited and even though this isn't quite what it needs to be, um, and I talk about, I think this applies to anything, not just game design. You have to like move over that hurdle and keep going. All hits, no misses from this team, by the way, so far. We've stolen Ian back. Ian is now going to be back on the Mythos Buster side. We can't lose another one. Yeah, I'm putting now. my podcaster hat back on. Um, <laughs> so jumping in with the questions. Um, what's something that players might not know about the design process for Arkham? They might find interesting or curious. I just said this to my friend uh, this morning. Uh, something that was surprising to me was, like when I was getting into design, was there's only so much text that can fit on a card. And so sometimes you have an idea for an ability or a thing and you're like, oh wait, it doesn't fit. Wait, if I change the, the font, or not the font, I, I, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> if I change this thing about it, will it fit? No. Okay, well I have to completely reword it, or I guess we just can't do that thing. Yeah, there's been multiple times where Duke and I are writing out a card ability and we're like, it doesn't fit. Okay, we need to change this title and make it shorter so that it fits. And then, so then open the thesaurus and like, what's another word for this? What's another, what sounds good? This doesn't sound good. Yeah, that's very true. It's a word economy, more so than you'd expect. <laughs> Super quick follow-up on that. If you can think of something that, uh, 
has been released. Was there ever a card idea that was just too big that you actually split onto two cards to get that entire idea in the game? The only one that I can think of is Parallel Wendy. That the, the title memento card was kind of just like, I can't fit, I can't fit the text. <laughs> what am I gonna do? So you just slap it on a permanent. We do not like doing that though. That's like emergency last ditch situation because doing that too much is kind of a crutch. It's like, it's like we designed an overly complicated ability. Oops, let's do it anyway. You know, like that's not ideal. Also, too, one thing that I've learned is that not only is it word economy, but there's a hard limit on the number of cards that can be included in each box. Like, there's a max. And so, not just this max, there's another max, the maximum number of cards. Uh, and so, like, you'll get to a point where it's like, okay, we need to cut some of these. And it's like, there's, some of them are doing great stuff, stuff that we love, that we really enjoy, but uh, which one is gonna go? Because you have to get rid of some. So, yeah, that just goes right into what you said. I guess, yeah, piggybacking off that, like, restrictions sometimes can be a good thing. Like, yeah, you only have so much to work with, but sometimes that inspires you and gives you ideas. And I guess one example for me was just looking at the core set and seeing all these extra chaos tokens. It's like, can we use these in some way, like, make a scenario really, you know, put these to use? So, like, city or things, maybe that's a cool idea to show a way to use those extra chaos tokens. And so sometimes that can be a good thing to have the restrictions and just gives you new ideas. So this is for each of you. Uh, what's the weirdest place that Arkham Inspiration has struck you? And if you can tell what what was the the product of that inspiration? I play a lot of video games, as you probably might know, and uh, a lot of times my inspiration comes from horror games, and that's pretty obvious. It's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but Kaimani is definitely inspired by Persona Five. <laughs> because that's like one of my favorite games of all time. And uh, I learned a lot about that, that idea of like the, the honorable thief, the picaresque thief uh, from that game. And so I think a lot of those ideas kind of got stuck in my head. And uh, that's, where, that's where Kaimani came from, I think. So Joker alt art coming at some point. <laughs> no comment. Oh. <laughs> I mean, he, say, he says that, but that's true. Like, I'm so new to the, like, I, I really can't give examples at this point. So, in a year or whenever, I'd love to do it again. Yeah. Nothing related to Excelsior to talk about? Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, I've already talked about this on when I was on Mythos Busters about it, but Excelsior was very much inspired by tabletop role-playing games and the freedom that comes with that and, and all the different outcomes that can happen just from one scenario, one adventure, and playing it with this group and playing it with this group and, and how it can change. Um, I, I pull a lot of inspiration from tabletop role-playing games, so, so yes, in that regard. Yeah. I was just going to confirm that the no comment was not because I didn't have one to share. Spicy. <laughs> I guess I like to go biking when it's nice out. You know, it's not too well for Minnesota, but sometimes. I mean, it's a nice snow earlier today, so maybe not today, but yeah, just off biking sometimes, just ideas come to you, just, you know, more relaxed state, and just thinking now, maybe we should do a, a bicycle asset, I don't know, that'd be kind of cool. How has your, I mean, pretty much excluding Nick, how has your uh, design process changed over the years, <laughs> years, Nick? Because you've been here weeks, but, um, like, especially Maxine and Jeremy, like, you've been at this quite a long time, Duke has been a couple years now, Nick, again, you're excluded. Um, from the, from when you started, what, how is your process different? How is your thought process different? I feel like when I first started with the company, uh, I had to go through that sort of like trial period, right? Uh, the same sort of trial period that maybe you two are going through right now, uh, where your ideas kind of have to be vetted and people have to sort of sign off on them. And over time, I think uh, they came to trust in my design capabilities. Uh, somewhat to the point where it's like this is what I want to do for the next cycle and they're like okay <laughs> uh, especially with the Scarlet Keys it was just kind of like let's just let MJ do whatever and I think it'll, yeah. yeah so I think that's changed a lot um, but as far as like my own internal process uh, I 
did this game kind of alone for a long time, like Dunwich, Carcosa, Forgotten Age, uh, most of, actually, yeah, all of the Circle Undone, most of the Dream Eaters. Uh, it wasn't until after that, like Innsmouth, we, we broke to Jeremy in, uh, Daniel Schaefer did a couple scenarios in Dream Eaters, and then since then, it's been like a huge, uh, like, now there's, well, there's four of us up here. Um, so that's changed a lot. Um, that changed my process a lot because then it was like, hey, Jeremy, what do you think of this? And then he would have an idea, and I'd be like, oh, I'm not doing this by myself anymore. I have to compete. So, yeah, that's different. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, actually, started with the company working on Star Wars Destiny, which is a, a very different game from Arkham Horror. It's you know, a competitive game, collectible with dice, so. Yeah, the mindset of, you know, I came from a competitive background, playing in tournaments, so I was more about, you know, mechanics, just wanting to do really cool, awesome abilities and stuff, but over the years we learned that, yeah, theme is very important, especially work on Arkham, like, it's a very story-driven game, theme is extremely cool, important to try to integrate into your work, so, yeah, I think over the years I really tried to more start with theme, if possible, and instead of starting bottom-up with mechanics, start top-down with theme, and a lot of times you get just better products that way, I feel, especially with Arkham. I guess maybe this speaks to something I said earlier, but um, I think a really early lesson that I had to tell myself about design is specifically, like I, I love writing and I was an English major in college, but um, as a designer, I felt a lot of pressure to make something perfect out of the gate. And I, I don't know, like a big part of the process has been like, okay, I have a strong concept, but, or I have a strong idea, how do we at least stab at that in the dark? How do we at least try and get at that with this first thing, with the note that like it's it can it can iterate from there, it can go from there, um, which sounds obvious, but it's something that you have to internalize, right? Yeah, I just want to dovetail off of that that like the impulse to get something perfect on the first try is really strong, I think, within any creative, and that's just physically impossible. It it doesn't happen. That's what editing is for, that's what playtesting is for, that's what iterating is for. Um, so like, yeah, we play the bad version of every scenario so that you guys can play the good version. That's just kind of how it goes. Um, I've definitely ended playtests on round two because I'm like, nope, this whole scenario has to be scrapped, you know what I mean? Like, and that's just the way it goes because that's, that's design and development, you know? Um. All right, we're gonna have a very Arkham-y question. Uh, so what is your biggest phobia, if you feel comfortable sharing? If not, you can share maybe your second or third phobia. <laughs> uh, and how has it influenced or changed how you design certain cards or scenarios, or maybe how you wrote an art brief? Anything along those lines. Caverns, water, deep, deep ocean, uh, underwater creatures, uh, Pitch black darkness, um, spiders, uh, just insects, insects in general, uh, and you'll notice all of those things appear in Arkham Horror, the card game, yeah. so and like, also Lord of the Rings. Yeah. yeah, it's just kind of yeah, just pull off of what you yeah. If if the art makes me recoil, I've done my job. I feel like yeah. Uh, my biggest phobia is public speaking. <laughs> So yeah, for some reason I love epic multiplayer scenarios though, so I love to design those and get lots of people in a room and have a lot of cool stuff happen and, and they have sometimes run those events too, like at Gen Con, so for some reason it's gone the opposite for me, so maybe that'll help my phobia in the long run. Uh, I, 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 don't, I think I'm still too new. I think, that, I think I'm excluded from this one. I'm not sure. What's your bigger pho biggest phobia? My biggest phobia is um, everyone figuring out that I'm a fraud and I'm making everything up. I know, I know. It's it's totally irrational. We've like, already figured it out, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Mythos Busters did that years ago. They figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I, but I like as far as how that influences my design. I I, I hold myself to a high standard, um, and uh, and I, I I I like to iterate a lot, and I like to like even getting stuff out to play testers like we had to push something to play testers today and i was like oh i i gotta do it first i gotta play it first i gotta do it myself first to make sure it's fine to make sure the play testers are you know that it'll be good enough for them you know that sort of thing 
And it's just like, well, that's their job is to find the problems and the issues and, and the things that you miss. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't hold myself to that standard. But you know, but there's no, there's no like enemy that's like, you're a fraud. I guess. So I mean, look for that in the future. I guess. Yet. Yet. Yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, everyone get ready for Jeremy's next standalone scenario, the panel at Gen Con, <laughs> in which your character speaks in front of a crowd. Speaking very real as well, like, I think everyone has that feeling of you're a fraud. Uh, or some people. Yeah. Yep. We all talked about you before this panel, and we think you were not a fraud, actually. I mean, um, but no, I think as far as phobias go, uh, I don't know, something that I always was very interested in in the mythos. Uh, my favorite my favorite expansion in Arkham 2nd Edition was the Innsmouth box. Um, and maybe I was really, uh, my favorite investigator in that box was Silas Marsh. And what I liked about that with the, that mechanic about the Innsmouth look was like, you never knew when this weird piece of the mythos was going to encroach. It was like almost body horror that you couldn't help. Um, that it could just pop up at any moment and then suddenly, oh, I, I, what, what is happening? Like, who am I? I'm, I'm like being put into this bigger world where I'm, I'm just a pawn. Um, so it's a roundabout way to say that I'm really into Silas Marsh. <laughs> who isn't? Who isn't? What's your phobia? Also Silas Marsh. Deep ones. <laughs> All right, lovely. Well, I think at this point we'd like to turn uh, questions over to the audience. Just go ahead and raise your hand if you've got one, and we'll work through. How did you decide which investigators to include in the core set of the card game? That's a good question. Uh, so we, we wanted to pick investigators who fit, who really neatly fit the themes of the five classes. Um, and then I just put Daisy Walker in because she's my favorite character. So yeah, so I just put Daisy Walker in, and, uh, and I was like, yeah, I don't care. Um, and then originally, Wendy was not one of the options, and we swapped out the original option for Wendy and kept the ability the same, which is fun. Not gonna tell you who it was originally. Disappointing. Sorry. Um, but, but the ability fit the survivor theme really well of like re-rolling kind of a test and succeeding where you thought you were going to fail. Um, if I remember correctly, the stats actually remained the same too, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, but then like skids wanting to have lots of money and being kind of slippery and evasive. And uh, Roland, obviously. I think Roland's ability was the very first ability that we designed ever. It was like, yeah, kill a mook, get a thing, done. Like, got it. First try. Um, and then Agnes was probably the hardest one. Because uh, we, wanted, we wanted Agnes to be, well, we wanted Mystic to be kind of a combo uh, faction at first. That we kind of strayed from that formula and turned that into Rogue uh, along the way somewhere. Um, but at first it was like, okay, what's a trigger, what's like a timing trigger that can generate some kind of cool thing? And we decided to take one horror, makes a lot of sense. There's a couple cards already in the core set that let you take a horror. Um, so it, it, it fit eventually, but um, I don't remember how we settled on Agnes specifically. I actually don't remember. It was six years ago. I don't remember. Maybe, maybe if Nate were here, he could tell me. Probably not. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Is there a uh, pop culture reference behind the art on Disguise card? Uh, so the question was, is there a pop culture reference uh, with regards to the Disguise art, the new card Disguise? Um, not that I know of. Uh, I remember writing that art brief, and I think it was a pretty basic premise. It was just someone swapping out, uh, you know, hair and makeup. And yeah, not... Nothing specific comes to mind. Maybe something accidentally happened it, in the art, but yeah. It looks like Tweak from Q-Force. Oh, I've never watched that, so I don't know. Sorry. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes people will find stuff and they'll be like, oh, this is definitely a reference to this. And I'm like, I have no idea what they're doing. I'm sorry. I see it now, now that you said it. <laughs> All right, so uh, is there a uh, particular investigator that you uh, that 
it, you thought would not go over well, but it, were pleasantly surprised by how well the investigator played. I, th I think Calvin went over exactly how I thought he would when he first came out, and I knew in the back of my mind, I'm like, two years from now, people are gonna love this character. And I was right, I think. I think people like him now, uh, but at the time he came out, people were like, why am I gonna play a character with zeros and all stats? This character sucks. And I'm like, no, he's really good. So, yeah. So, Piggy, backing off that, where several years later a character kind of comes into their own, uh, I'm really enjoying these new clue dropping mechanics in this latest expansion. When do you decide you want to revisit, like, kind of older cards and kind of bring them to the forefront and like, you know, reintegrate them in a, in, a, in a way. Yeah, that's a really good question. So like, a lot of the early cards in that archetype are from like Dunwich and Forgotten Age and Carcosa, because that was an idea that we had very early on in like our color pie when me and they were working on the course that it was like, oh, Seekers could have clues as a cost for things. And then those cards came out and everyone hated them. And I was like, okay, clues are too steep a cost. Lesson learned. Uh, but it always kind of stayed in the back of my head. I always wanted to revisit it. And uh, it was always something that we kind of like had as backup cards that got cut from every cycle because they were just slightly too weak um, until Scarlet Keys. And then it all kind of fit. And I think it was the research notes card that just made it work. Um, and the press pass, but mostly the research notes. Like it was like, okay, if spending clues is too high of a cost, let's just give the clues back. Um, and lo and Stop behold, it works. <laughs> Stop for a refund. Yeah, yeah, we did it. <laughs> oh, it it kind of worked well in that in the gambling, also that like thematically in the one that we just played. So let's get those clues back. Nice. Uh, so first of all, uh, thanks for telling me that uh, your inspiration for Kaimani was pers uh, darker from Persona. Now I know the five XP has to be set on the black hat. <laughs> um, but uh, speaking of the Scarlet Keys, that maybe you can answer this uh, for the, the actual campaign coming up. Can you speak to any of your inspirations for either mechanics or story bits or whatever? Yeah, there's a lot of inspirations for the Scarlet Keys campaign. I think overarching story, uh, like the SCP stories, is a huge inspiration for me, for us. Uh, the Men in Black movies. Um, basically, any like. Any government agency doing supernatural stuff, Delta Green, um, there's some other ones. There's more. X yeah, oh, X Files, absolutely. In fact, I think we named the character after an X Files character. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, all of those um, are huge inspirations for us for the Scarlet Keys. Um, I grew up overseas, and so I spent a lot of time traveling internationally, and I really responded to the globe trotting theme. Uh, thinking about like smells and experiences of different places and what other places just feel different when you go there. So that definitely made its way into the, the work I did too. Yeah, piggybacking off of that, I've only ever left America once to go to Japan. Uh, so it was pretty self-evident when like I read the story text that you were submitting and I was like, oh my God, this is good. Like you know your stuff and I'm just sitting over here like, I guess there's ramen, I don't know. So like, it's really good, yeah. Yeah, it definitely shines through. Um, I have two questions. First one is, how did you decide, or when do you decide to bring in a new character versus revisiting an old character, such as Charlie King? Oh, uh, well that one's, that's pretty easy actually. We started running out of old characters. I mean, there's only a, Few, there's only a handful left of like the veteran cast of Arkham Horror and we knew we wanted to keep going with this game and we didn't want to stop doing investigators in every box so uh, there came a time where we needed more investigators so we brought a bunch of different pitches to uh, the studio at, this, at the time this was when we were doing the starter decks so we, we came up with about I want to say like seven or eight new investigator ideas, and then had a meeting, whittled those down to like five, had another meeting, whittled those down to three, like combined two of them, and so on and so forth, until we had Winnie, 
Stella, and Nathaniel. Thank you. Wow. Um, and, and then, you know, as we continued, when we got to Scarlet Keys, it was like, well, we still need more. Um, so we pulled some of those other pitches that we didn't get to do, um, and then Kaimani, I just came up with. Um, and um, yeah, we'll see if that trend continues. It's gonna depend. Can't say anything. Great, thank you. Uh, second question, it's kind of a goofy question. Uh, my husband and I have uh, a nickname for Peter. Um, we often call him our boyfriend uh, because we include him in so many decks. Uh, so do you, either of you have nicknames for some of the investigators or the characters or investigators? I mean, anybody who listens to Mythos Busters knows that. Uh, what is his actual He's name? my boyfriend. <laughs> well, that, there's that too. But I was talking more about Leo DeLuca uh, is actually the Mississippi manatee. Um, and that's just, that's just stuck for me. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, we've got a few, but yeah, for me at least, it, it arrived, we arrived at that just from the Mythos Busters with Bro X and, uh, and Madame LeBron and just silly little phonetic games like that. But anybody have a more interesting answer? Has no one else called uh, Madame LeBron uh, Sugar Granny? <laughs> well, now we will. I don't. I don't have any. I'm boring. Sorry. Uh, I think that Peter Peter Sylvester has to be the most shipped character within the the Arkham Files universe. I have kind of gotten hooked on some of the community's nicknames for certain characters, like Nacho, Nathaniel Cho. Um, uh, uh, there's another one that I'm forgetting. Cool. Good answer, me. <laughs> I did it. All yeah. right, we had another one here. Uh, going back to choosing characters and uh, choosing whether to bring in new characters or rather to pull old characters, is there any thought of uh, tying Arkham Horror back to more of the uh, Chaosium? Call Cthulhu roots for the the setting and uh, thickening the connections there. Um, I think that's probably something that we would probably avoid, um, not for any specific reason. Um, I know there's some legal stuff going on with that, um, but more so it's just like we want Arkham Horror to be our own property, um, and even though those roots will always be there. Uh, I think we have more fun making new characters. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, uh, so you all talked about earlier about difficulty level and balancing that out. Um, I think everyone who's played the game knows, right? You can sometimes get in a situation where you're like, God, please don't feed ancient evils. Um, <laughs> but um, I think uh, oftentimes what I'm struck by is how um, difficult it might be to balance the difficulty plus the storytelling, right? You want to allow space for people to play different investigators and not have to be optimal all the time um, because it allows right, different investigators to exist in the world and, and, and players to play with a, a wider variety of play styles. So I wonder if y'all could speak to that. Like, is, is that a thought? Or, or obviously it's probably a thought, but like how does that, uh, enter your thought process as you're designing for difficulty. Yeah, definitely. Um, not just with difficulty, but just in general. When we're doing scenarios, when we're doing player cards, investigators, uh, we want this game to appeal to a great many different players. Uh, we want it to appeal to uh, expert veteran players who are card game fanatics like Jeremy, uh, who like value efficiency and really like to make a well-oiled deck that's really good. But we also want it to appeal to like someone who's just picked up a core set and they just want, they're interested in the narrative element or the storytelling element um, and everything in between, right? Uh, so when we're making player cards, that's always a consideration. There's different types of players we want to appeal to. Some cards will only appeal to certain kinds of players and we have that in mind as we're designing them. With scenarios, it's the same thing. 
And a lot of that is just listening to our playtesters and also knowing our playtesters and knowing like, okay, well, this is a playtester who highly values this kind of experience. Um, so that is factored into their feedback when we, when we read it. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know, did, did you want to speak to that? I was gonna say, just as someone who loves playing the Soulsborne games, uh, I obviously love difficulty, and I know MJ does. Um, I think that uh, if you make, like, the goal is not to make a scenario easy to stomp, of course. I think that that's definitely one extreme too far, but it, unless it's like the finale, or unless it's like a specifically, you know, we want this to be a, a climax or a, a, a huge hurdle, um, the goal is to make it something that an average player could play and beat. Yeah, sometimes like sometimes different scenarios we want to hit a very specific story beat, and sometimes that means making us a, a particular uh, scenario or even just a particular act within a scenario disproportionately difficult uh, or disproportionately easy, just to like drive home a specific like emotion or narrative element. Um, so like Essex County Express is a pretty good example of that. <laughs> So like I think I we got to that scenario and I was like I want like half the players to lose this one and Nate was like okay nailed um, it yeah nailed it <laughs> yeah so uh, sorry not sorry yeah just to pick it back off that quick I think it's a good point some scenarios should be tougher than others like a finale of the campaign should feel a lot tougher than the very first scenario of the campaign so that's one way to play with the difficulty uh, we also have difficulty modes you know easy standard all that kind of stuff. I would have been toying with the ways to maybe try doing that instead of just the chaos bay. Like Edge of the Earth kind of did like add more doom if you're in like, more difficult mode. And I think future products will keep experimenting with that to try to give different tastes of how we can do difficulty since yeah, a lot of players, you know, they have you know very different experiences of the game. You know, some have just started, some have been playing many years, some have been playing other games for a long time. So it's hard to try to balance all these different wide variety of player experiences with a single scenario or campaign. But yeah, we're going to keep experimenting with that because yeah, it's it's a, a tough challenge. But I think one way you'd like to keep working on to make the game as fun as it can be. Yeah, I'm going to actually second that. Um, the modular difficulty levels and easy standard, etc. That does a lot to accommodate to your play style. Um, and like when I first got the game, I was like, oh, I'm going to play on hard because I'm a I'm a big player man and I'm going to do it. And Trying to prove my own machismo to myself, I guess, but it, there's it, there's no like it, that's the dumbest thing to do. Like find the difficulty that works for you, and if you're playing on easy like me, or even if you play on easy like me, and you throw an extra plus one in the bag, no one's gonna come and take it away from you. You can't do that. It's it's my game. You can't take it away from me. So, <laughs> so no, I think I agree. The modular difficulty does a lot for accommodating that freedom uh, to accommodate different play styles. And I agree that there's a lot of design space that we can explore where the game, even beyond the tokens in the bag, the game itself adapts to the different difficulty levels you've chosen, so. All right, uh, on the topic of confirming upcoming products, uh, when you're writing the design notes and you're including your little uh, teaser bit about the next campaign setting, how do you decide how much you want to give away? Somehow I get away with that every year. And they haven't stopped me yet. That's all I'll say. This isn't recorded, right? It stays in this room. It's not recorded well, anyway. Uh, so... One design feature each, each time an expansion comes out is that you explore brand new mechanic space, like with the Bless and Curse tokens in Innsmouth, or now the customizable cards. How difficult is it to brainstorm and come up with these brand new mechanics and then support them with the card pool in, in the expansion they come out with? I would say, at least for me, I can't speak for everyone, but for me, like coming up with the new ideas, the easy part, it's implementing it and executing it in a way that's like enjoyable. That's the hard part. Um, so like bless and curse, like I think we came up with those like almost instantaneously. Like it was just like oh there we go done, um, and then we iterated and iterated and iterated and iterated. 
Um, the versions that we first came up with look nothing like the versions that ended up in the game, and that's kind of the, the case for almost every new mechanic that we make. Um, so it's like, if you're a creative, coming up with ideas is easy. Narrowing it down to the idea that you actually want to use and executing it in the right way, that's the tough part. All right, now I'd love to do this all night, but unfortunately we do have to wrap up pretty soon here, so we're going to do one more, uh, and I've already picked it. You can, you can meet me outside later if you're upset. I won't fight back. I'll, I'll also, we'll be here, you know, if you have any other questions. Uh, yeah. A lot of the recent scenario, the campaigns, I mean, like, um, ha have included at least one scenario that is just completely off the wall. I'm thinking, like, City of Archives, the pandemic thing from um, the, uh, you know the scenario. Which scenario about. is that, Nick? <laughs> um, or, uh, or, 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 like, the Alina Harp, the Van Alina Harp with the Clue one, right? Um, what's your opinion on, like, like, do you like designing those things, or like, is it something that like you have to fight to get in there, or you know, what's just your thoughts on the design of those compared to other like uh, no, more normal market scenarios? It it kind of differs each time. It kind of differs depending on the campaign. Like, um, like for example, that scenario you speak of, which is in the clutches of chaos, by the way. Yeah, uh, that scenario was one where it's like I came up with the theme and I was like, all right, I want to have these like breaches popping up over here and like incursions, and I want it to be like you have to run around and like try to figure. And I was like, oh, that's pandemic. <laughs> okay, um, and you know it's also kind of similar to the Arkham Horror Third Edition board game, which was in development at the time. So I was like, I'm gonna steal that. So, uh, but then there's other scenarios like um, uh, like City of Archives, for example, where I was just kind of following the story as it naturally progressed. Um, and I was like, okay, well, if you body swapped, you'd be in the CODIS in a Yithian body. I'm gonna design that scenario. I don't know how, but I'm gonna do it. And I did. Uh, and then like the same thing with like Fatal Mirage. Uh, kind of had this idea for this like recurring nightmare sort of scenario where you're stuck in this mist of memories and different like um, uh, concepts being thrown at you from all these different partners that you have in your party. And uh, a lot of those times, those scenarios just kind of come naturally from uh, developing the story. Um, I don't know, without, without revealing anything, are there any like upcoming wacky ones that <laughs> there might be. There might be. There's at least one scenario in the Scarlet Keys that's like, what? <laughs> I think that was yours. <laughs> yeah. Another element of it, though, also is like, there's a number of different asks that you can have in any given product that you're making. So like, you can have a cool idea for something. We like. We, can, we only have the resources for this amount or this thing. Um, we only have the time to develop this this far, even though it's a really cool idea. We have to push this down the road or we have to move this in or um, even reduce it if we can just to just to save space and to, to meet the deadlines of the product. So that's another piece of it too. Yeah, I'll also add that the new, the new format for the campaigns has really allowed us to explore a lot of different ideas that we were otherwise kind of unable to do because of the linear aspect of the story. Um, so now we can we can do more weird scenarios that feel kind of optional because they are. Um, and the Scarlet Keys is kind of evidence of that. Like the whole campaign is basically optional. Um, I'm a big fan of Chrono Trigger, uh, one of my favorite video games of all time, in which you can just skip to the final boss at any point. I love that. I think that's awesome. So, similarly, you can sort of, not exactly immediately, but you can, you can do that in Scarlet Keys, and I think that's kind of cool. Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild, yes, another good game, yeah. Elden Ring. <laughs> Elden Ring. Does that mean you beat it, MJ? <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> I beat Elden Ring. Yeah. <laughs> Show off. I beat Elden Ring. I, I just moved. 
moved, okay? I didn't have the time. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, a big thank you to all you guys. Like I said, it's an amazing thing uh, for, for a game like this to have you guys be so accessible and so willing to, to share a peek behind the screens. It's always a pleasure to talk to you guys. Um, and I on. see your thank you, and I raise you a thank you because you put all of this together, the panel, and a lot of the activities that are going on in the other room, the Iron Man tomorrow, and um, everything that you do for the community, so, yeah. Wow, I just got gratitude judo. For that, for that! Also on that, yeah, we are here for you. We love you all, like you're all the reason that we make this game, and uh, feel free to approach us through the weekend. And thank you guys for joining us. Have a great Arkham Knights, y'all.